Right, so a rather big change. Um, I think it's also really nice to see once uh, I've added the uh, non-metal gold parts here, it, the red really starts to, to pop out and look mm -hmm. a lot more vibrant as well. Um, sometimes that is a little hard to guess where everything goes uh, when you paint bit by bit. If I would paint a miniature for myself, I might even just paint the red armor on the leg and then do the gold parts on that leg to finish that leg. Oh, hopefully. really? Yeah. Because um, I try to keep my paint mixes quite simple and I could always come back and do... Because here it's also just like a three color blending with red, white, black. We, we were just saying this off camera actually yeah. about how there, there are some painters, I've read tutorials of non-metallic metal and people will go crazy with glazes of purple and glazes of green and on the mid-tones in it to, to finish off. Yeah, but yeah. We would, I was just saying to you how the, the really simply you're just using three colors. You're yeah. using black, white and then the, the primary color and then, and then working from there. And I think it works quite well to some extent. I mean, if I would do a showcase miniature, I would definitely go and push it also with colored glazes uh, or some inks to get in a little bit more glossiness. Um, but I think it's quite amazing to see that just with three colors, you can make uh, material work in a very believable way. Mm -hmm. And um, and you don't need to have these kind of complicated mixes of yeah. two drops of this color, one drop of this color. Yeah, and then, and then one you drop go back and glaze with that. And yeah. uh, it's quite hard to actually repeat the same effect if you have that many colors um, mm -hmm. working for one material. And because I just used three colors, they have no problem of painting this leg and this gold here another day or in two weeks because mm -hmm. I will definitely remember which three colors I used for that. <laughs> so um, There was a point where I, when I was first learning that I, I had believed that you had to have a syringe and you had to, to fill out like to the one millimeter yeah, yeah. <laughs> and get, and get everything right. And, everything uh, had to be and then you write down in your little recipe book all of what you've used. Um, so take out your recipe book, uh, guys. <laughs> uh, we're now painting some uh, cold non-metal gold. And as I said uh, earlier, uh, when we talked about the colors and what colors we will use, I said I want this to be uh, cooler than uh, actually the non-metal that we've used for the, the good guy, mm -hmm. um, the Storm uh, Stormcast Eternal from the Age of Sigma. Um, and it's funny because when you see that miniature just like this, you're like, yeah, sure, it's gold like the like uh, we did on the Sigma. Mm -hmm. But uh, let me get in the Sigma for a second. There he is. And wow, the, the <laughs> difference, it's, it's like, you know, one, you can see one is hot, one is cold. Yeah. And I really like that effect because just next to each other, you can see the, the true difference of the the gold. Well, it's actually interesting now because looking at it with the two, you've got like the warm gold and then the cold blue, and then on contrarily, you've got like the warm red and the cold gold. Yeah. But I, I think that's it's quite important to play with with that um, just a little to make the contrast of the part of the different elements next to each other mm -hmm. just stronger. So play with the warm and cool as well. So yeah. Um, here for uh, this gold, um, I've used a base of model color Japanese uniform with a little bit of black. The black will make it uh, look a lot more green actually. But um, yeah, that's really what we want to achieve that cold, cold look. Coming back to something we were saying um, off camera, um, so something that confused me a lot coming into painting was the, the wide variety of paints you can buy. Um, that, that really there's like no one superior range to another. There's there's just, there are certain paints in certain ranges which are, are typically very good and then yeah. some which, which don't work quite so well. And it's it's a case of of, of experimentation, um, talking with your friends, you know, colors that, that, they, that they like, they've had success with. Yeah, definitely. Especially, you know, just for example, when the new Game Workshop range was introduced, it was like 18 new colors or something like that. Uh -huh. So you cannot really test them out all yourself. Well, you could, but you would go crazy actually. Because yeah. it's really important that you know the uh, 
the properties of your color. So you need to know how they dry, if they're satin or matte or mm -hmm. uh, whatever, how they flow, how for which techniques they're good, how much you can thin them down. And that you can actually just uh, you can save a lot of time when you discuss that with your friends. Mm. And just saying, okay, you use that color. Which brand is it from? Is it any good? Can you yeah. can you give me any advice on that? I've I've picked up so many so many good colors just just through that from speaking through friends like um, uh, the Vallejo model color ivory. Yeah, is a lovely color and, and quite quite a few painters I I I've spoken to they also oh yeah brilliant off white color. Yeah, the um, the, <laughs> the ivory was a bit uh, one of the three colors that I tend to use uh, really a lot in my projects before I discovered the Schmincke white. Right. Um, because it gives you just that warm light color that is really good to get the sun, sunny daylight feel on the figure. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we could we could one day set you the challenge of just giving you uh, ivory. Uh, deep deep sea blue and uh, some tank brown and just saying you have to paint the entire miniature using only these three. If you give me black with that, I think I, I, I can work <laughs> with good. it. Can I have black as well, please? <laughs> so now it's the base color on the brush and um, you can see this side is already a bit darker mm -hmm. um, because I want my... Um, is, is that because you did like... One la one layer on one side and then two layers on another to make it slightly slightly more saturated. Uh, yeah, I think so. Maybe it was also a bit darker on the palette, um, but it's a very easy way to get a little difference in there is by uh, just applying one layer on on one side and another on. It's something um, that that was introduced to me by um, Andy Wardle when he showed me some some non metallic metal, and uh, he 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 does that exact set. So he'll do like. A, a larger surface area underneath of one layer mm -hmm. and then a slightly smaller surface area over the top of the same color yeah. and you create like a small transition just using the same color mm -hmm. and then he worked his way he works his way up through that way and you can achieve a, a, a wonderful effect just yeah I just actually, through that i actually painted uh the skin of the papa jumbo like that oh okay so it also works really well for skin mm -hmm. and the good thing is a lot of people that have problems with getting uh, harmonious colors uh, that's a good tip for them because you cannot fail with one color yeah it will just be darker in some spots where the foundation is still shining through more mm -hmm. and uh, you just work your way up uh, uh, would, would you say that, that when you you primed the miniature would, did you do it with zenithal lighting would, was that something that helped that you have like a black base coat and no, that white I, no I just did it on just did black. It with black yeah um, the advantage of doing it with black is you just have to put more color layers on the highlight area. Mm -hmm. If you would have done the black and white, uh, you have to work more with washes. And um, if the foundation, um, for the, especially the Games Workshop white in the can, uh, leaves quite a rough finish. Yes. yes. If you don't spray loads of it. Right. So that is kind of a problem if you work just with glazes, you will always see the texture. And mm -hmm. for skin, you want a smooth finish. Um, we were talking earlier about the Shield Maiden, the Shield Maiden yep. for that uh, felt leather. I can say I have held it and it is absolutely <laughs> stunning. It's, it's just as beautiful in real life as it is in the pages. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, but if you, you want to use that, uh, that grainy look for a texture effect, that is quite interesting, but uh, as I said, skin should be softer. So, I, I honestly thought you had sat there um, like uh, Kirill did for the beret on the Highlander, and, and and just done tiny, tiny little little yeah, you know, little little touches of the of the brush to to create that effect. Uh, it was the lazy way, <laughs> <laughs> just uh, five minute. Actually, it was really easy because it was just. Uh, Spray paint and then glazes from there on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so possibly you might be listening into this right now, thinking, um, Jack, would you stop talking to Ben and maybe he could he could start explaining a little bit more what he's doing in case <laughs> in case this is you haven't seen the Age of Sigmar and this is the first time you've seen Ben doing non metallic metal. All right, yeah, that's maybe <laughs> maybe that's a good point. <laughs> So I try to uh, really force the contrast here on that middle part. And as you uh, can see, we added the highlight here on that side. So I want this side to be the brightest as well. Mm -hmm. As I have, it's like a little chamfered 
uh, on the on the top. So I have like a strong contrast line here. Yep. Where I just place the highlight right on the t on the peak of that mm -hmm. shape. Uh, I'll continue just highlighting the edge here with the side of the brush. And I have to make sure that the upper part here stays quite dark, so um, we'll actually not touch that part. And just go with the uh, our um, base tone that we started with and use that to do, um, place some highlights here on the lower side of the arrow mm -hmm. and also here on the top. And we will just increase that a tiny bit, <coughs> but not going all the way to the white. Uh -huh. Some some people might be thinking right now that 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 look that might look quite odd as it is right now, but that's that's really how light would work because it, the 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 way that it's raised it would block off that light and you would have that that sharp yeah um uh, effect that it's almost like you, that line and if you were to look at real metal in real life it it would have that effect yeah definitely and it's really to make the uh, non metal look not not like a, a just a dull material you really need that strong forced contrast mm -hmm. and um it's a bit the same the, the that i the same way that i approached the middle area it's like one side is quite bright and the other is almost black uh-huh um it's the same here we try really try to force the contrast and it's always one uh light side um, facing a dark side, or here we have it's as as is most things in life. <laughs> you have the lights in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> so here we have like the very light here, darker to the middle, and then again a bit softer here mm -hmm. and lighter. And we will have just the opposite here. We will have a darker here, a bit brighter there, and again darker there. Uh huh. Because even if you you had a light source shining directly onto that metal. That it's it's extremely unlikely that it would be angled in such a way that it just perfectly reflected and you had that smooth one light color going all the yeah. way through. Even if you had like a like you were shining a torch directly at a piece of metal, it would still have those really dark bits, even with a light shining yeah, directly. Yeah, definitely, on because it. it's it's not it's not really shadow. It's also uh, the reflection of uh, objects in the in the environment or the horizon or whatever is around the metal mm -hmm. you would have a reflection it's a bit like just take a look at the tap at uh, at, at uh, your bathroom or your kitchen um the chrome reflects just the environment so you have that very dark line contrasting the very hi bright highlight lines mm -hmm. and if if you're at home watching this I'm, I'm guessing you're like me and you're extremely disappointed this didn't um uh, deviate into ben doing charades i, I was really hoping for that I'd love to see you trying to uh, to do uh, spout with your arts. <laughs> <laughs> non metal spout. Uh, that, that highlight here is just a tiny bit too bright. So try to hit it with a bit of yellow on top. Mm -hmm. um, and it comes back to what we were saying before. Even any time that, that there's something like that, you can always just paint over and start again. Yeah, definitely. Um, but I really like the the contrast here on the front already. Um, also, the the whole impression will change once I add the highlight here on the uh, on this lower element here, mm -hmm. because then we will have that round element from the from the knee protector, just looking very beautiful and, and clean, I guess. It's amazing how much um, neater and much more control you seem to have, just just by loading your, your brush properly. Like, well, not properly, but like not, not all uh, the way. slamming it full of paint. Yeah. You know, you're 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 not only keeping keeping the brush better, but like uh, pointier for longer, but you're 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 getting more control from it as well. Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, I'm doing all the fine detail work here with a with a one um, brush size one. Yeah, I think I'd. I'd have a zero at this point, but I'd probably have like my, my three zero close to hand <laughs> just in case. Um, but it's interesting actually that you say that with the one, it, it could be something that, that people at home, you, you set yourself the challenge of just painting the miniature using only the, the one and, and, and forcing yourself to go all the way through with it. Yeah. 
you could you could really do that. Yeah, we could. And it's important. A lot of people tend to really darken areas like that down because they're just a lot more facing downwards. Um, but actually, if you look at that from the side, you will see that it's just really the the top area that would catch a lot of light. Yeah. So always pay attention uh, to your imaginary light source. Mm -hmm. Sounds stupid, but uh, you really have to keep that in mind. Also, I will just take some a little bit darker color here and just paint this here, and you will see. And and that that shows the the importance of of when you mix your, your paint on the palette, you have the transition starting from dark to lighter so that at any point you can just pick something out of it yeah. that you need. Another another good reason for using the wet palette. Yeah, true. If you would to do that on the tile, it could drive you crazy because the paint would dry off instantly and you had, mm -hmm. especially in, a, in an environment like that with six lamps uh -huh. just just around the palette so um but even if you do it at home it's really good to have your uh, color mixes at hand for a longer period uh, matt has a wet palette that he can just uh, close pretty pretty much airtight not not 100 percent, but pretty tight and he can paint with the same mixes for about a week mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's um, David Rodriguez. Yeah, the painter. He, yeah, he, Kurt Kerkal. Yes, he. Um, sorry, I'm just. I'm. I'm I, I've been hearing so many painters' names um, <laughs> these last two days. It's 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 a lot to take in, um, and certain things are getting pushed out. Uh, uh, he he recommended in a setup for a painter to actually have a small fridge in, in the studio so that you can. Once you finish for the day, you close your wet palette up, and then you can just put it in the fridge and keep it cool. Yeah, a nice idea. I think if you're living in Spain or any or southwest of the U.S., you you know when it gets hot and dry, mm -hmm. fridge could be quite a good help. I think something as well that that I picked up using a wet palette is is to be realistic about the amount of paint you have on the palette and how long it's going to last. Because I, I, I had this idea in my head that because I've set up a wet palette and I've got paint on there, it's going to last forever, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And I sometimes, uh, I've, I've seen a picture of a friend's palette and there was like the tiniest little dot of paint on there. And it's not working, it keeps drying out. <laughs> You've got so little paint on that palette, it's, of course it's going to dry out. Um, So again here, the same direction of light, forced strong light on that side. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that is quite important is that you are really um, working plane by plane here for the transitions to get a very nice and sharp look. Um, I'm just putting the base color down and I'll show you what I mean. Um, this edge here is when you put the figure like that is actually catching more shadow than light. Now we have the strong highlight here, so we want shadow up here. Okay. Um, I will do that just with a bit of black in the mix. Place it there. Clean the brush. Feather it out. It's really amazing the difference that the feathering makes. Yeah. It it it, it really does seem like that, that to be one of the, the crucial steps. And the part the upper part here is one plane and another one here. Uh-huh. This here is slightly curved outside. So we have here, this part would catch more light than the upper part. Okay, yeah. So I'm loading my brush with the base color. It's white on the tip.
No, no, we were saying how like uh, different paint ranges have have, diff have uh, colors which um, seem to work better than others. Mm -hmm. Now with that white that you have, it might not be available in everybody's home country. Are there any other um, artists, like uh, uh, acrylic artist paints that you've tried like for the heavy body white? Yeah, the uh, the ones from Golden Acrylics are quite nice. Uh -huh. uh, you can get those in a lot of countries. Um, and I don't know, actually the uh, white from Model Color is quite good as well. Uh -huh. um, and if not that... The, the regular white? Because the, there's quite a few whites. In yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's one white white. Right. It's, like the, it's called white. Okay. The, that one is quite good. Uh, but if you're not sure what white you you use, also technical wise, the ivory is very very good. Okay. So before you go for a cool white or something like that, rather stick to the ivory. It gives you an easier hand on the natural look. Because light is from the sun, and the sun is warm. Yeah. So yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. And now I'm just highlighting this edge here. I'm blending a little bit of the base color. And with some pure white. It's time to Darker color here in the shadows. Just here facing the white highlight. So that's that's like a one of the classical ways of um, how you would set up the light on, on, a, on a surface like that in, in like a classical non-metal. If you have um, the, the more modern approach on non-metal is full of textures and you just do a lot of scratches and lines but still have that color theory underneath. Mm -hmm. You see once, once we are picking up little elements like the rivets, um, that will also make this everything here a lot more painted and it's I was just about to say it's it's interesting how just a couple of strokes in the right place can suddenly change something um, yeah yeah it's it's I think it's very nice because that way you know you don't have to spend uh, like half an hour getting everything super clean it just works like that mm -hmm. um, the strong contrast is strong enough you, your eyes will definitely focus first on on the contrast sure on the highly contrasted areas you know when um when michael was doing his 42 hour stream Someone was saying to me that, uh, oh, that must have been tough sticking along with him doing the 42 hours. And it, and it was kind of its own battle because he, he's there, do, he's got lots of things going on, so it kind of keeps you busy. You know, yeah. I was just doing like um, like modeling stuff, keeping along. But but sitting here watching you do this is just absolutely thrilling to me. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is like watching a football match and it's one all and we're into extra time for like 45 minutes now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm happy that, uh, that I'm that entertaining. <laughs> I, I, do, I feel like I should have like a scarf of like Ben Comets just waiting and, and uh, or, or kind of like sitting back with a big thing of popcorn and I can, I can just like, watch the uh, movie. Not your head. Yeah. So uh, one important thing when painting plastic uh, miniatures is you will ha always have those kind of weird shapes because you can't do any under undercut in the uh, in, in the in the mold mm -hmm. so you always have that weird kind of shapes on the back side so it's always a question how you highlight that and if that actually works when you paint the whole surface or if you maybe even cut out a piece with a with a sharp knife or right. 
um, just drill in there with the, with the um, Dremel and clean that and make it a bit smaller. This here, because the, the armor itself is quite bulky, I think that works quite well to just paint it as it would be a, just a, a surface of gold material. Mm -hmm. Would you would say would you would you then say that it's also a very good idea with with like a miniature that, that holds so much detail as this to when when you're preparing it to kind of really pay attention to all the little details and have kind of like a, a plan of action in your head as to how you'd approach certain parts. Definitely, um, I think it's it's very good to make up your mind before you start because you need to have certain things in uh, in mind when you do the preparation. Mm -hmm. For example, um, if you take a look at the cape, um, here the end of the cape, I just cut that open, drilled some holes in there uh, to make it look more interesting, give it more texture and look more oh, okay. uh, wild, because the, in, in the plastic kit it's just pretty much just straight and you have... Yeah, I, I, I genuinely thought that was the model. I, did, <laughs> I, did, I didn't think that was, that was it. <laughs> and also, like, here was another part where um, you can see it because I didn't clean it properly but uh, I just cut out a piece here of the plastic because because due to the molding process this just is right just very flat so I wanted to have that and it's it's much better to to do those things beforehand yeah. than to be like at this stage where maybe you've yeah, yeah, yeah. stuck it together and you've 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 watched this video and you've come up with something that looks identical to this and then now you have to sit there and sand away at something. Yeah, yeah. you don't you want to like. avoid that definitely. And so um, yeah, at that stage, if I discover something like, for example, if that would be too big for me now, I would not really start and uh, sand it or cut it off. I actually would try to do just paint and paint it just black on top and. Create a highlight next to it to give it a bit more detail. Uh huh. It seems to be the the the. the I, I often see people posting on like Facebook. What's that one thing that bugs you when miniature painting? Yeah. And for me, it's always that tiny little <laughs> tip <laughs> the, the, that the somehow one. gets at uh, the end, and always at the point when you don't need it. There, it's like the, oh, the, one, oh, the one hair of doom. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of kind of annoying, <laughs> but uh, what were we talking before the hair? I don't know. It it must not have been important. <laughs> uh preparing the miniature. We're talking ah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's it's quite amazing what you can actually achieve um, with like fake painted on det details mm -hmm. that that are not in the sculpt. Or even how much you can change, like the the, the sculpt, for example, of a of a bust. Uh, we were talking off camera before, and I'm looking at the the Aladdin's cave of miniatures that that you guys have on there. Uh, the piece that Christopher Octave painted mm -hmm. as a gift for you guys. There's um, a miniature in the cabinets where there's a, a girl like um, shooting two guns, and Christopher painted these lines on the skin to make it look as if it was, um, she's like an android, like yeah. the, the lines of, of armor plating. And um, I was looking at the piece and I genuinely thought that that was part of the model. I thought that was the design that those were those were engraved on. Yeah. Um, and it was only when you came over and, and started <laughs> saying, oh, there's a beautiful piece, Christopher Rock too. And uh, yeah, he actually painted these these lines. <laughs> it just totally blew my mind. I was like, <laughs> um, yeah, and I think not only with details like that, but also the way how you, for example, um, place the lights on the on a bust, on like the shield maiden, you could mm -hmm. create a totally different different face actually by just just by the way how you place your lights. So I think it's quite cool to actually see how much power just a simple brush and paint has. Like, right. To really change some something that a lot of people are afraid of, like, oh, okay, no, it, that looks like that. It needs to stay like that. But you mm -hmm. can really modulate a lot. Would you say then it's it's very important to try and uh, to try and grasp an understanding of how light works when you're painting miniatures? Definitely, I think um, if you want to to take your painting to to the next level, so to say, it's really important that you think a lot about uh, light and shadows. Mm -hmm. And 
really observe uh, your surrounding and uh, I always found myself like studying light everywhere and um, I read a fantastic book about uh, it was a classical uh, color theory and illustration not on miniatures mm -hmm. and you had a lot of interesting uh, examples of uh, pictures for example of people reading newspapers and on the uh, in front of a, a blackboard and on the picture you had just color samples and parts of the white that were in the shadow were actually darker than the blackboard in the back oh wow. your mind just said, okay sure this is a black surface yeah. that is a white newspaper and it's really important to really think of what colors you see mm -hmm. and not what colors you have in mind yeah So, um, I think that's definitely a good tip to, to mention that, that yeah. there are books out there where you, you can read information that, that can and take you further. definitely not only miniature books. It's Ex important yeah. that you are have an open mind and uh, just keep looking for stuff that might be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, here on the non-metal plate, you can see I am where I have also placed the highlights in the red. I'm just placing the highlights in the very same angle and then the very same direction here. I have this edge here as well. It's a well, because that that instantly changes it. Yeah. You know, that's <laughs> it's just it's incredible man, it instantly changes it. Let's soften that out here a bit. You see something like this, that, that like that particularly that area having the, the small uh, holes in, in the pad almost um, would would intimidate me to, to get those little points of contrast. But I think if you're if you if you've loaded your brush with without loads of paint, you just have enough on there that you need. You're 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 um, careful and patient. It, it it shouldn't be something to be afraid of. Definitely. Um, also, uh, the nice thing about uh, this kit, for example, is that stuff like the the border here, they're erased really quite quite a bit from the underlying uh, surface. So you can easily paint it with the side of the brush without even having the fear of touching the, the red layer. Mm -hmm. It's actually, it's interesting to me that, that I see you saying that you're doing like the side of your brush to get those things because because often, um, I've I've read in some places people would say, "Oh, you should never use the side of the brush when, when you're drawing a fine line. You should only ever draw that that fine tip." And I, I I think as a general rule, I think I I kind of agree with it. But then there are certain little edges that there's the one there's no need to drive yourself insane trying to get that that fine line when you can just hit it with the side of your brush. To be honest, I try to do as much as I can with the side of the brush. Uh huh. Um, and just get a good angle for the brush and pull it over the side. It just it's a lot easier mm -hmm. because you know really trying to to have that tip just hitting where you want it to is a lot harder than just um, using actually the side and with a, in combination with a loaded brush. It's very easy to create a transition in one go just with the side of the brush. So. Um, I really like that. I can't wait for the next person to chastise me for using the side of the brush. I'm going to say, well, Ben comments. Uh, <laughs> master of the loaded yeah. brush and the side of the brush. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but I can show you again what I mean here on the side, just doing a small uh, blended edge highlighting. Um, just with the loaded brush and the side of the brush. Oh, you have to be careful that there's not too much paint on the brush. Wow. Make it look so easy. <laughs> <laughs> because it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. It is that easy and it's just the doomed side of the brush. <laughs>
Also here, why you try to hit that with the, not with the side of the brush. Edges like that are just perfect for the side. Mm -hmm. Okay, looking at this edge here, I like quite like the bit stronger yellow impact here on the on the reflex. That is uh, because I've been glazing over with a little bit more of the um, um, of the um, Japanese uniform that I've not mixed with black, so it's the pure Japanese uniform, and I will just take a little bit of that to glaze here over the mid highlights to create a stronger saturation in some parts, but not over the whole surface. Mm -hmm. Also really happy with the with the color combination of the the red and the cold gold. Uh -huh. um, let me just get this one. See now that is a name for a paint. I'll have a bottle of cold gold, please. <laughs> oh no, that's a name for a beer. That's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Painting that... Buddha, cold gold. Oh man, I love it. Yeah. I love the, the sound of that. That's pure gold. <laughs> Okay, so far for uh, the gold um, parts that we have here on that part of the armor, as um, I already mentioned, the back part is uh, won't be seen anyway. Mm -hmm. So I just painted that in the dark uh, yellow and dotted some few harsh lights in there. And if you're if you're like me and and you're painting this at home, I would use that back part to try this out first, just before yeah. I went on to, to the front parts. If this was your first time doing it and you're sitting with, yeah. with the video. Yeah, yeah. good point. Um, also, we were discussing uh, when I when I painted the red armor, the, I, I painted already the front uh, plate of that. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that will be covered. I will just put that in place. Uh, yeah. So we, you will just see that. It's, it's barely visible. Yeah. yeah, you see just see that top reflex there. And yeah, I think it's, it's quite nice actually to see it now with the that massive part on top. It's it's a gorgeous figure. I mean, yeah. we've been saying this all the way through the video, and your people listening probably are uh, saying <laughs> it, but it, but it really is a beautiful figure. Yeah. All right. So um, I think as a um, uh, next step, I will do off cam a little bit of the uh, non metal gold little elements um, because they are very much the same. So I'll continue uh, finishing uh, those and. After that, we should be back for um, getting the uh, X painted. Awesome. All right. Mm -hmm. 